All right, guys, so we're going to continue on with chapter 12 um, with lecture two regarding the health record. And today we're going to be really talking about maintaining and using the electronic health record. So we're going to discuss the backup systems for the EHR as well as the, the transfer, destruction, and retention health records as it's related to um, the EHR. We're going to describe how and when to release health uh, the health record information and discuss health information exchanges, or HIEs. And we'll discuss and identify the two methods of organizing a patient's paper medical record, both the source-oriented and the problem-oriented methods. We'll discuss how to document information in the EHR and a paper health record, and how to make corrections and alterations to that health record. We'll discuss dictation and transcription, and discuss transfer, destruction, and retention of medical records as it's related to paper medical records. We'll identify filing equipment and filing supplies needed to create, store, and maintain medical records as well. And then finally, we'll discuss indexing rules and how to create and organize a patient's health record. We'll discuss the pros and cons of various filing methods, as well as how to file a patient health record. We'll discuss organization files, uh, organization of files, as well as health-related correspondence. And then discuss patient education, as well as legal and ethical issues related to the health record. So we're covering a lot today, guys. It shouldn't be too, too long of a PowerPoint. Um, lecture, but just follow along, keep up, and this is really important stuff, guys, so really focus on this stuff. Take your time and understand it, because everything we do is related to the patient health record. We're constantly updating and working with them, so knowing how to use them, how to file them, is essential. Um, so HIPAA requires that facilities uh, adopt backup and recovery plan that includes daily off-site software backup for the EHR, the electronic health record system, in case of long-term power loss. So for example, if a natural disaster occurs and the provider's office is without electricity for several days or even weeks, the provider must have a backup system for the EHR so that the office can continue to function. So there are several alternatives that can be used for data um, and backup, uh, preservation and backup. And we will talk about all of these backup methods on the next slide, but they all require an alternative source of power in case the disaster that interrupts electricity. Maybe it's an off-site one, that is not hooked up to the same power grid. Maybe it's uh, a generator that will help establish power in the facility, but an alternative way to get power has to be used for these file, uh, the backup data. So here are the alternatives that you can use for backup data. You can use external hard drives, and, a, and an external hard drive connects to the main computer and with fairly simple programming can copy the information in the EHR daily. And then you can have full server backups. And basically the provider may want to back up the electronic health record system on a dedicated server. So the server is only dedicated to this EHR, which is a, a large capacity computer set aside specifically for the EHR system. And then you have uh, online backup systems. And basically an online backup system can be used for usually for a subs subscription fee, excuse me. Um, and it just backs up all this data into the storage cloud. It's like an iCloud online. Um, medical assistants should keep their paper medical records, uh, their skills up to date and sharp just in case the EHR system is down for an extended period of time and you have to resort to paper medical records. So yes, everything we do is going to be on the computer and in regards to electronic medical records. However, if there's no power or you have a natural disaster or something along those lines and the system goes down, you must know how to do it by paper because the show must go on. You know, you're still gonna be treating patients and seeing things, so you're gonna to have to uh, find an alternative way to do that. So the transfer, destruction, and retention of EHRs. So in most medical offices, records are classified in one of three ways. They're either active, which means that the patient has been seen within the last six months. There's inactive, which is they haven't seen the provider within the last six months. And then there's closed, which means the patient has either died, moved away, or terminated care with the provider. So the, there's a process of moving files from active to inactive status, and that file is called purging. So that means moving files from active to inactive. And an EHR system can be set up automatically to move the inactive records to another server so that the processing time will not be slowed down. Um, so it's just important, it is essential that you guys know what an active, an inactive, and a closed file are, you will be asked these types of questions on your Certified Medical Administrative Assistant exam, so it's good to know those. So retention and destruction in regards to that medical record. So retention means how long do you have to hold on to it, obviously destruction means that you get rid of it. 
So providers who have an, obli have an obligation to retain patient records, whether it's paper or electronic, you have to keep it. Okay? There is no current nationwide standard rule for establishing uh, record retention schedule. So there's no current uh, like national law that says that records have to be kept for a certain amount of time. But the records for any patient covered by Medicare or Medicaid must be kept, be kept for a minimum of 10 years. So when no rules spe specifically specify, I'm sorry, when no rules specify the retention of health records, the best course of action is to keep those for a minimum of 10 years, especially for Medicare and Medicaid. Before old records are discarded, patients must be given the opportunity to claim a copy of that record or have it sent to another facility or something like that. And to legally destroy an electronic health record, the record, including the backup record, has to be overwritten using the utility software. All right, now guys, this is retention and destructions in regards to electronic health, health, uh, the electronic health record. All right, so with paper, it's a little bit different and we will talk about that later on. So the releasing of health information. HIPAA has designated that very specific information must be included on the release of information form. So you must have them fill out that form. So requests for medical information have to be made in writing. Electronic signatures may be accepted as long as they are obtained with the proper process controls. And most health, uh, most offices charge a fee to print or to copy health records. And it, it's you need to pay uh, particularly close attention to records release requests involving a minor and making sure that you have covered all bases and that the proper person is really is requesting to release that information. So guys, HIPAA and, and, and patient security and confidentiality guys is one of the key you know, cornerstones to our job as a medical administrative assistant. So you need to make sure that you're paying particular attention to the rules and the legality of it so that you're not getting yourself into any trouble. Um, so a staff member should always remain with the patient who is looking at his or her health record. You never want them to take the record or to remove parts of that health record. So you always want to monitor that person when they are in uh, sight or within the same reach of their health record. And when a release is presented to the office, copy only the records requested in the release, never copy more. Now, if you are getting a request from, say, a lawyer um, who is representing the patient and the patient as well, and they're, say, the patient is requesting the whole file and the lawyer is only requesting, um, you know, partial part, parts of that file, you want to go with the, the one that is releasing less information. So you would go with the lawyer who is only requesting part of it because they may not need the whole medical record and you can still maintain that patient confidentiality. One way to avoid that situation is to call the patient, explain what's going on and figure out what they truly want to do. So if there's any questions about what needs to be release, released, make sure you contact the office manager or, or the provider to make sure that you are releasing the information that is necessary. So health information exchange. So the demand for health, electronic health information exchange from one healthcare facility to another, together with nationwide efforts to improve quality and efficiency of healthcare, is creating a demand for HIEs. Now currently there are three forms that exist. There's the directed exchange, and a directed exchange is the ability to send and receive secure information electronically between care providers to support coordinated care. Then you have a query-based exchange, and a query-based exchange is the ability for providers to find and or request information on a patient from other providers, often used in unplanned care. And then you have consumer-mediated uh, exchange, and a consumer mediated exchange is the ability for patients to um, aggregate the control and control the use of their health information among providers. So it's, you know, know those three forms of health information exchanges. Now let's talk about, we've talked about the electronic medical record and how to release information. Now let's talk about the actual content of that medical record. So the first type of medical record is going to be your source oriented medical record. So the traditional patient record is source oriented. That is observations and data are entered by the provider, laboratory, radiology department, nurse, technician, and others with no rec uh, recording of a logical relationship between them. So it's just put into the, to their medical record based upon which person it was. 
So forms and progress notes are filed in reverse chronological order um, at, by separate sections of the record. Okay, each, each sec, there's different sections of the record and they are all filed within reverse chronological order. That is another one, okay guys. Some files may be included in chronological order. However, most patients are in reverse chronological order so that the provider and staff members do not have to reach to the bottom of the chart to find the most recent laboratory result, um, for example. So the first one was source-oriented medical record. Now this one is problem-oriented medical record and it tells you exactly how it's oriented. The first one was source, this one is problem. So the problem-oriented medical record, which is uh, the acronym is POMR, is a departure from the traditional system of key keeping patient records and divides the medical action into four bases. Okay. The first one is database, and the database includes the chief complaint, present illness, the patient profile, the review of systems, their physical exam, and then laboratory reports. Um, the next one is but the problem list. And the problem list is a numbered, titled list of every problem the patient has that requires management or workup. This may include social and demographic troubles in addition to strictly medical or surgical ones. And then you have your treatment plan. So the treatment plan includes management, additional workups needed, and therapy. Each plan is titled and numbered to the uh, respected problem on the problem list. And then you have the progress note section, and the progress note section includes structured notes that are numbered to correspond to each problem um, from the problem list, and then updates on those problems. So the problem-oriented medical record has the advantage of imposing order and organization on the information added to the patient's medical record. So there is a difference between source-oriented and then problem-oriented medical records. So we talked about the progress notes section. Okay, so most progress notes sections are going to follow the SOAP approach. Okay, SOAP is an acronym. So it stands for Subjective Impressions, Objective Clinical Evidence, Assessment and Diagnosis, Plans for Future Further Studies, Treatments, or Management. So subjective, objective, assessment, and plan, okay? So some subjective information is going to be information that the patient tells you, okay? It can th be things like their chief complaint, uh, how they're feeling, any symptoms they're feeling, things like that. Objective information is things that you can see and measure, while assessment is what you diagnose them with, um, or differential diagnosis, or um, something along those lines. And then P is how are we gonna handle them? What is the plan for them? Okay, some medical offices will include an E in the record to represent evaluation. So it could be SOAP, S-O-P-E, S -O -A -P -E, or some offices will use an S-O-P-E-R where the E would stand for education and the R would stand for response. So the SOAP method forces a rational approach to the patient's problem and assists the formulation of a logical, orderly plan for patient care. So the SOAP method is most often used in the problem-oriented medical record. So if you go back and we look at the last slide here, the fourth base is the progress notes base. That is where you would enter in your SOAP notes. So documenting into the EHR. So if you look on figure uh, 2-10 on page 214, okay, so, uh, the upper half, okay, that is an example of an electronic health record and that is how you document and add information into the EHR. You can either use radio buttons, which are the ones you can click on um, to put a check mark, uh, it can use drop down menus where you click on something, it'll drop down a list of different answers you could apply, and then free text boxes where you type in certain text to, reg uh, to answer them. Um, so it is, made, it is important to carefully review the choices made so you make sure the information is accurate and, and complete. And then information documented using free text boxes should be proofread before submitting. So the boxes that the patient types in or that you type in when you're entering in information into their electronic health record. You need to make sure that you proofread it before you hit submit. That, that way you're uh, free of errors and the information is correct. Um, so documenting in the paper medical record. So guys, that was all in the electronic health record. Now documenting in the paper medical record is a little bit different. You have to actually write stuff in there. So the entry will always start with a date in the month, month, day, day, year, year, year format. Okay, so this could be like 10, 26, 2016 format, that's how you would write that, followed by the time. Now if military time is used, it is in the four digit format with a colon, where it would be like 1400, colon, zero, zero. Um, all entries must be written in black or blue ink, you never wanna use like pink and green and, and um, reds and things like that. 
and the documentation should be in order in which the steps were completed. All right. Now, if you ever have to make corrections or alterations to health records, um, there are specific rules for this. Now, these ones are for a handwritten entry. So if you are making corrections to, um, say, a, an appointment book or um, a paper medical record, it's important to follow these steps to make sure you're doing everything legally. So the first step is to verify the proper procedure for making corrections according to the facilities, policies, and procedures manual. These guys are like the standard. Now your office might have a little bit different and you would best find that out by looking at their policies and procedures manual. Erasing using correction fluid or any other type of obliteration is never acceptable when making corrections. Errors made while using computer are simply corrected the usual way, backspace, and you correct that error. However, with paper and handwritten ones, it is a lot different. So if you make an error, draw a line, one single line through the error. Don't scribble it out, don't erase it, don't white it out. Draw a single line um, through it, and then insert the correction above or immediately after the error in a spot where it can be easily read um, and, and not you know, hard to read. If it's indicated by the policies and procedures manual, you might have to write error or ERR in the margin just to show that there was an error made that was corrected. And the person making the correction should write their initials there or sign it at the, uh, below the correction and date the time or date when you made that correction. Um, so it's important that you have all of this there. So however, an error discovered in an entry at a later date is corrected in the same manner as a handwritten entry. And this is sometimes, sometimes called an amendment. Um, so even if you go back and you reread into their medical file and you notice that there's an error in it, still correct it the same way using the date you adjusted it and everything along those lines. So dictation and transcription. All right. These are two jobs that you may have to do in your medical office depending on the way your doctor um, prefers it. So transcribing dictation is a job that a medical administrative assistants perform periodically. So basically, what dictation is, is instead of having the provider take notes and writing notes down while they see the patient, they dictate it or they speak or they, they say what they're doing and what they're seeing into like a voice recognition software or to a, to a recorder. And then you would reread, then the, the medical assistant would listen to it and transcribe or write out what was being said in the proper place. So hand, transcription can be done in the form of handwritten notes, such as shorthand. You could do machine dictation using machine transcription unit or portable transcription unit. Um, it can be a system accessed by telephone, or it could be done uh, accuracy and speed. So being able to, to do it quickly and, and accurately are your primary requisites, things that you have to do in order to be good at transcribing. Now, voice recognition software may also be used but with the increase of use of EHRs and voice recognition software, uh, there is a decreased need for transcription because now the computer is transcribing it for us and it makes uh, our jobs easier. So the transfer, destruction, and retention of paper health records. Now we talked about the transfer, destruction, and retention of electronic health, re health records. Now we're gonna be talking about paper health records and there are differences, guys, so it's important to pay attention to those. So medical considerations are the primary basis for deciding the length of retention. Providers have an obligation to retain patient records that may reasonably be of value to a patient, according to the American Medical Association Council of Ethical and Judicial Affairs, which we talked about a ton in chapters uh, six and seven. All right, always check state laws before, you di uh, before destruction, before you dispose of a medical record. Uh, currently, there is no standard nationwide no, there's no standard nationwide rule exists for establishing a re records retention schedule, just as I said earlier. So, however, at a minimum, you want to keep for at least a, the statute of limitations for malpractice claims, um, which is usually three years or longer. It's, it differs according to the state. However, Medicare and Medicaid patient records must be kept for a minimum of 10 years. So it's important to contact the patient before destruction and to be sure to preserve confidentiality. Uh, before any old records are discarded, patients should be given the opportunity to claim a copy of that record or have it sent to another provider. And to preserve confidentiality when discarding old records, destroy the documents by shredding or through a professional document destruction service. Okay, And as with electronic health records, 
Paper records can be classified as active, inactive, or closed the exact same way. And the retention and destruction guidelines for paper records are the same for electronic health records. All right, so it's just know that it's still the same thing regardless of um, paper or electronic. Then you have long-term storage. Now there are many different ways and, and, and things that you can do to store these medical records long-term. And maybe your offices use microfilm uh, if electronic health records is not currently in use. And in microfilm or optical disc technology are both expensive and probably not practical for any but a very large group practice or health maintenance organization so that the facility should be moving towards some form of electronic storage. All right, so for electronic storage, as we've talked about earlier in this, in this lecture, it's important to back up regularly and have those um, at an, uh, an, uh, another place. Okay? You don't want to leave that backup in that computer. Okay? What if that computer crashes or you lose power for an extended period of time? You need to have access to those backups. And then, of course, transfer of paper records in, onto optical discs are the other way. Um, what I mean by optical disc are like CDs, things like that. Okay, so we've talked about the medical record. We've talked about different filing methods. We talked about how to construct the inside of a medical record. Um, now let's talk about filing equipment. Okay, so now that we get the whole record together, we know how to use it. We need to file it. And now there's the most popular system today is color coding on open shelves for filing. All right, color coding on open and shelves. That is the most common way for paper files. Um, some of the supplies and equipment that you might use are, are drawer files, which are something similar to this where you just slide out, slide in. Uh, you could have horizontal shelf files, which are similar to this, except they pull out like a whole drawer, like a dresser drawer almost. You have rotary circular files, compactable files, automated files, or card files. So some of the factors that you should be considered when selecting a filing equipment should be the office space availability, structural considerations of your office, the cost and space of the equipment, the size, type, and volume of the records that you have in your clinic, the confidentiality requirements, how long it would take you to retrieve a record from there, and then of course, fire protection. So some more supplies here that you might need. Um, each file drawer or shelf should be equipped with plenty of dividers and guides. Now if you look here on page 216, okay, the out guide is a heavy guide used to replace a folder that has been removed temporarily. The label is a necessary filing and finding device. Use labels for identifying each shelf, drawer, the divider guide, and then folder as well. And if you look on page 218 in the text, you'll see procedure 12.3. And that is, um, that just, you should refer to that to understand how to create and organize a patient paper health record. So indexing rules. So things you need to consider when filing. And what I mean by indexing is, is the proper way to file each individual folder on there. So if you look on page 217 in your textbook, I just flipped by it, on the bottom you'll see table 2-2 and that is a nice one that it helps you explain how to apply indexing rules. So the first thing you do is last names are considered first in filing. So for me, it would be Clausen is how I would be filed. Then your first name is considered and then your middle name or initial is considered third. So compare the names beginning with the first letter of the name. When a letter is different in the two names, the letter, that letter determines the order of which is filing. So for example, if we are trying to file Cody, or my, my name, Cody Clausen, and say Cody Clark, okay, we look at the last names, Clausen, C-L-O-S-S-O-N, and Clark, C-L-A-R-K, Clark would come before Clausen to be filed. Initials precede a name beginning with the same letter. And then hyphenated elements are considered one unit. Um, so with hyphenated personal names, the hyphenated elements, whether the first name, the middle name, the, or the last name, are considered to be one unit. Um, the apostrophe is disregarded in filing. So if you have an apostrophe in your name, disregard it. Um, indistinguishable foreign names. Okay, that's another one. When indexing a foreign name in which cannot, you cannot distinguish between the first names and last names, index each part of the name in the order in which it is written. If you can't make that distinction, use the last name as the first indexing unit. Um, and then again, guys, if you have any questions about um, what to do and how to do it, look on page 217 at the bottom and it gives you a great chart for you there. 
Um, here's some more rules for you. Abbreviated parts are indexed as written. So if it's like junior, okay, you don't have to spell out J-U-N-I-O-R. Uh, okay, you don't have to spell out junior. You just simply abbreviate it J-R. Uh, Mac and Mick names, last names that start with M-A-C or M-C, are filed in their regular place in the alphabet. Okay, if the files have have a great many names, if you have a ton of files that begin with Mac or Mick, some offices file them as a separate letter of the alphabet for convenience, so it's important to know that. Um, the name of a married woman is indexed by her legal name. Okay, so if, legally, if it's not changed to her married name, you go with her maiden name. Titles may be used as the last filing unit if needed. So when followed by a complete name, titles may be used for the last filing unit if distinguished uh, if, if needed to distinguish the name from another identical name. Titles without names are considered the first indexing unit. And then degrees used only to, degrees used only to, used, sorry, degrees used only to distinguish from an identical name. And then articles disregard, for example, the, a, are disregarded in indexing. So it's not like Cody Clausen the third. Um, that is disregarded. Okay, guys. So there are different methods of filing now. We talked about how to how to file. Now there are many different ways to file. So those indexing rules, those were in regards to alphabetical filing. So alphabetical filing is the simplest and most commonly used, and it is a direct filing system. Now what I mean by that, alphabetical filing is a direct filing system in that the person filing needs to only know the name in order to find the desired file. So if you were trying to look up my file, you would need to know my name, Cody Clausen, and how to spell it, and I could go directly to the shelf and pull out that chart. It requires only a filing cabinet or shelf, folders, and divider guides. However, there are some drawbacks. Now, some of those drawbacks can include the correct spelling of the name must be known. As the number of files increases, more space is needed for each section of the alphabet. This results in periodic shifting as folders, uh, of, of folders to allow for expansion. And then as the files expand, more time is required for filing and retrieving each folder because the greater number of folders involved in the search, the time can be greatly reduced by color coding. Now that's a nice little aspect. Now if you look on page 219 at the bottom of 219, or I think it's at the top of 219, the bottom of 219, you'll see procedure 12-4 which describes how to file medical records using an alphabetic and numeric filing system. So the next one is we're going to talk about is the, that numeric one. <coughs> Excuse me. So some form of numeric filing combined with color and shell filing is used in by practically every large clinic or hospital. So if you're working in a small group practice, alphabetical filing system is most generally what you will see. However, once you get into the hospitals and bigger practices, you will see numerical filing. It is an indirect filing system. Okay? Alphabetical filing was direct, numeric filing is indirect, which means it requires the use of an alpha cross-reference. Now what I mean by that? Every folder is given a number, okay? That number represents a patient. You need to find out what number represents the patient you're trying to look up, so you have to use a cross-reference for that. Now, there are some advantages. It allows for unlimited expansion. Numbers go on forever. It provides additional confidentiality due to the fact that the name is not on the outside of the folder. And then it saves time in retrieving and filing because all you have to do is know how to count. Uh, now, there are several different types of numerical filing that exist, um, and those can be it could include straight or consecutive numeric filing where patients are given consecutive numbers as they visit the patient. So patient number one, two, three, and so on and so forth. You could have a terminal digit system or use the last four digits of the patient's social security number. So those are all different ways that you can do that. Now this way requires more training, but fewer errors will occur due to the fact that all you need to know is how to count. Um, now there are other ones that can be used. Um, subject filing can be either alphabetic or alphanumeric and is used for general correspondences. And what I mean by that are, are letters. The main difficulty with subject filing is indexing or classifying. That is deciding whether to file a document. Um, many papers require cross-referencing. When a color coding system is used, both filing and finding files is easier and misfile, misfiling of folders is kept to a minimum um, because you can the use of color visually restricts the area of the search to, for a specific period, and it's really easy to see if you have a purple folder stuck in with the yellow ones, okay? Uh, files can be color-coded in several ways, and color coding is used in um, numeric filing as well as alphabetic filing, so it's, that's good to know. 
Now we're almost finishing up here, guys. The organization of files, okay? Now you can have many different types of files in your, in your office and it's important to know how to organize them. Correspondence pertaining to patients' medical records should be filed with the case history. Other medical correspondences should be filed in the subject file. Correspondences of general nature pertaining to the operation of the office is part of the business side of the, asp uh, of the practice. Most active financial records is the patient ledger. Okay, in facilities that still use the manual system, this is a card or a vertical file tray, um, and the accounts are arranged alphabetically by name. Papers that do not warrant any individual folder are simply placed in a mis miscellaneous file. Tickler or follow-up files. Okay, this is important to know. A tickler file. This will be on your CMAA exam, guys, and it's it's important to know that. Um, the most frequently used follow-up method is a tickler file. So called because it tickles the memory that something needs to be done or followed on by a particular date. So this is basically just a chronological arrangement of things that need to be done. Uh, and then you can have a transitory or temporary file. The transitory file is the materials with no permanent value. The paper must be marked with a T and destroyed when the action is complete. So in closing guys, advances in the medical records occur rapidly. Be willing to learn, adapt to changes and always keep a positive attitude. Now, the medical assistant should always explain any paperwork that the patient may need to be required to complete or sign. Take the time to explain any form that needs completion or signature so that the patient understands the reason for collecting the information and the medical staff's need to have it available. The authority to release information from a medical record lies solely with the patient unless such a release is required by a law through something such as a subpoena. Ownership of the record is often a subject of controversy the record belongs to the provider. The information belongs to the patient. It's important to remember that. <coughs> um, so basically, the primary goal of all healthcare facilities is to provide efficient, high-quality patient care. The electronic health record system can help the staff reach that goal. So it's important to stay abreast of news and articles related to EHR systems um, so that you're always on top of, of, of that and you can give that patient the best care possible. In the future, all providers, offices, hospitals, pharmacies, and other healthcare facilities may be able to access information in minutes, which will improve patient care and help save lives. So finally, the legal and ethical issues regarding this. Uh, the patient must authorize the release of health information in the electronic form, just as, if it, just as if it were in the paper form. It has to be done the same way. Okay, electronic health record systems must do a few things. It must maintain security and confidentiality of data, it has to be easily retrievable. It has to have safeguards against the loss of information. <clears throat> it has to protect patient rights and confidentiality and privacy and requires identification and authorization to access. So by supporting these requirements, the me medical facility remains in compliance with applicable laws and gains the trust of patients who are reassured that the health information is safe and secure. All right, now if a patient feels comfortable that everything is going right with their record and then no information is going to be released, um, you know, you'll get more referrals out from to other people in the, in the community and you'll bring in a bigger population into your office uh, resulting in more revenue for you as well so that is it in regards to the health record if you have any questions please feel free to ask me in other words have, have a great time good luck have fun and keep working hard guys